Good day. Last week, I spoke about the succession of Russian officials who have spoken in very strong terms about the conflict in Ukraine, ruling out negotiations on a freeze or a ceasefire of the conflict, keeping the situation essentially as it is with some kind of an armistice that is not acceptable to the Russians. They would see it merely as a device to rearm Ukraine, what's left of Ukraine, reintegrate it into the West, ultimately bring it into NATO. And of course, that is precisely what the Russians will not agree to. And we've had comments to that effect from uh, the Russian foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov. He spoke twice, he gave two interviews, essentially saying this very thing. We've had similar comments from Dmitry Shoigu, the Russian defense minister. And we've also had comments from Vyacheslav Volodin, the Speaker of the Duma, the lower house of the Russian parliament. All of these people, Shoigu, Lavrov, Volodin, and uh, uh, um, Shoigu, and Medvedev, of course, being members of the Security Council, all of them ruling out negotiations, all of them saying that the Russians are not interested in a freeze and will continue the war until Russia achieves fully its objectives. And in addition, yesterday I discussed how um, Pyotr Trotsky, who is a deputy speaker of the Duma, um, made further comments and he spoke about how the Russians um, eventually will acquire more territory in Ukraine. They will take control of Odessa, Kharkiv, Nikolaev, and the city the Russians called Dnepropetrovsk, of the Dnieper, but which the Ukrainians called Dniepro. Well, today, the ultimate decision maker, or rather, yesterday, the ultimate decision maker, the president of Russia, the supreme commander of the Russian armed forces, Vladimir Putin himself spoke, and he gave an enormously lengthy um, address and question and answer session at the Valdai Forum. This is a forum at which the Russian leadership, not just Putin, meet and confer and hold discussions with um, various members of the um, academic and diplomatic world from around community from around the world and it's a major sounding board <clears throat> for the Russian government they're able to um, articulate set out their ideas and programs and listen to what these elite people think and of course it all culminates in a plenary session and it was over the course of that plenary session that Vladimir Putin dealt with the issue of Ukraine and where the conflict is going. Now, before I proceed, I just would say that, um, to my pleasure, I noticed that two Duran contributors, people who have been interviewed by uh, myself and Glenn Deason, on the Duran, um, participated in this plenary session and put very interesting questions to Putin. One was Richard Sakwa, the British historian, and the other was Sergei Karaganov, who is um, a, a Russian ac academic by, from recollection at the High School of Economics. You can you go to the Duran and you check there, you will find the interviews, the videos of the interviews that Glenn Deason and I did with these two eminent people. Anyway, there we go. They were all there at Valdai and they had their discussions and their talks. But um, initially, at least, I will focus on what Putin had to say 
about Ukraine. He said a great deal of other things. We've done a dedicated program about Putin's speech at the Valdai conference. <clears throat> Alex Christoforo and I out on the Duran. I'll just touch very briefly, therefore, on some of his further points that he made over the course of um, this program. But let me first of all deal specifically with what he had to say about Ukraine. Now, and the conflict there. And of course, he gave his well known views about the history of the conflict. He repeatedly made the point that the fighting in Ukraine did not begin in 2022, it began in 2014. He said that the Russians aren't waging war on Ukraine, they are seeking to end the war that began in 2014 in Ukraine. That's, of course, a claim the Russians have made many times. Ukraine and, of course, the West strenuously resists it. And he described the lead up to the conflict. He described in a most interesting section the arguments over the, U the um, association agreement with the EU, which was the event that provoked the protests in Maidan Square in Kiev in 2013, which eventually, in February of 2014, culminated in the overthrow of President Yanukovych. He described the events attendant upon that overthrow as an illegal coup. He made his usual statements, his usual characterizations of the government that emerged out of that coup as a nationalist, extremist government permeated by the ideology of the 1930s and 1940s in Germany. Um, he made some very interesting parallels when there was some attempt to push back about this. There were some comments from a German questioner about whether the government in Kiev could really be characterized in that way. And this person, um, this German questioner, brought up um, a meeting between Russian officials, and including Sergei Lavrov and the IFD in Germany, um, which this person said some of its members also adhered to this ideology. Putin, Putin very strongly pushed back about that, but of course it gave him the ideal opportunity to bring up once more the events in the Canadian Parliament, the fact that President Zelensky was there, the fact that he joined in the applause that was extended to that person who was invited to the Canadian Parliament. And anyway, Putin spoke a great deal about that. And he also spoke about the way in which the West conducts its foreign policy, about the way that it aggressively and relentlessly expanded NATO East, despite earlier promises not to do so. He spoke about the way in which the West, the United States especially, no longer conducts diplomacy in any meaningful way, the way that the United States engages in pressure and bullying, and that the West disregarded repeated warnings from the Russians both about the risks that this relentless expansion of NATO eastwards was creating and of the way in which the Russians might respond to that. Anyway, so there was a lot of background provided as well. But Putin also discussed some, a few facts about the state of the current conflict. He again reiterated that the Ukrainian counteroffensive has been a failure, that it has achieved no breakthroughs on the front line, on the front lines, that the Ukrainians have failed to meet any one of their objectives. And about that, by the way, I think it is becoming increasingly difficult to take issue with him. And he also gave 
new casualty figures for um, Ukrainian losses over the course of the offensive. He claimed that Ukraine has lost 90,000 men dead and wounded. That's an increase from the 71,000 that the Russian <coughs> defense minister Sergei Shoigu gave a couple of weeks ago, short time ago, relatively short time ago, suggesting, by the way, that in the few weeks since Shoigu spoke, Ukraine has suffered a further 19,000 casualties. Of course, these are Putin's figures, Russian figures. Putin also gave figures for the number of tanks and armoured vehicles destroyed, over 500 tanks, thousands of armoured vehicles. He spoke about the problems the West is experiencing in weapons production. He talked about the fact that the West can't increase ammunition production to meet Ukraine's needs. He showed a high degree of awareness of all of these things. But eventually, he came and discussed, though in a very elliptical way, Russia's objectives in the war. And he went out of his way to say that as far as the Russians are concerned, this is not a war for territorial con conquest. Russia, as he pointed out, is the world's biggest country by far. The Russians, therefore, have no need for extra territory. They have a vast amount of um, ter um, territory in the Far East and in Siberia, which they need to develop. And it's not for them a question, therefore, of territory. It is a question of people and of security. And he went out of his way once more to say that NATO membership for Ukraine is out of the question as far as the Russians are concerned. But he also spoke about the security of Russian people in what might have been once described as post-1991 Ukraine. And he went out of his way to say that the war began because Ukraine, the government that was established in Ukraine after the events of 2014, the Maidan, the Maidan coup, as he would describe it, in February 2014, has not only not accepted the rights of Russian people, Russian-speaking people in Ukraine, but it has acted to suppress them. And he spoke about the fact that Ukraine launched military attack on Donbass in 2014, that they sent aircraft and tanks against the people there, and that it, this is what started the war, and it is the failure, the inability to resolve this problem diplomatically, a failure for which the West, according to Putin, is ultimately responsible, well, that is what has led to the war. And therefore, from a Russian perspective, it is the protection of people, their own people, that matters. Now, this is very interesting, and it does open up some very interesting points. The first thing to say is that Putin is now talking about people in Donbass and Zaporozhye and elsewhere in Ukraine who speak Russian or whose first language is Russian or as Russians. He no longer refers to them as Ukrainians or as Eastern Ukrainians or as Russian speakers or any of those previous words. From this point on, they are Russians. 
he was asked specifically about Odessa. And he said that Odessa is a Russian city. Again, without any qualification as to that. And then he had a question from Margarita Simonian, the um, head of um, um, RT, about Odessa. It's an interesting question. Um, she said, uh, she asked the question, Odessa is a Russian city, a beautiful city, and it seems to us that Russian cities should live in Russia. So the question is, where would you like us to stay? That was Simonian's question. And Putin answered it in this way. Now, about where we should stay. You know, it's not about territories. It's about guaranteeing the security of the peoples of Russia and the Russian state. And this is a more complex issue than some territory about the safety of people who consider Russia their motherland and we consider them our people. This is a complex issue that requires conversation. So, he didn't say, well, Odessa is a Ukrainian city. He said it's not about territory. The war is not about territory. It's about protecting people. It seems to me that these words can be interpreted in a very ambiguous way. They leave open the possibility of a territorial settlement in which Odessa does not become a part of Russia. But of course, logically, following the logic of um, Putin's words about protecting Russian people, it's, they don't rule out also. These words do not rule out at all, in fact, the possibility of Odessa becoming Russian as well. Now, John Helmer, that most insightful and experienced of Western reporters and journalists and commentators on Russian affairs, he's actually um, made a comment about this. He said, which side of the stop line for Odessa in the coming Russian offensive? Question mark. Putin yesterday about where we should stop. It's not about territories. It's about guarantees of the security of the peoples of Russia and the Russian state. So you can interpret this in all kinds of ways. You can say that Putin is prepared to stop before Odessa is reached. But of course, if those security guarantees are not provided, then the Russians will indeed go further. Now, the point is that it's difficult reading Putin's speech, Putin altogether. It's difficult when you read them to see that he actually believes that there will be secure security guarantees given for people in Odessa, a city which he has now characterised straightforwardly as a Russian city. Now, even as Putin was speaking, even as he was talking about this, he's, num he's uh, um, number two in the hierarchy, the vice chairman of the Security Council and deputy, his deputy, his deputy as chair of the Military Industrial Commission and the nominal leader of Russia's ruling party, the United Russia Party, 
Dmitry Medvedev was also writing things on his Telegram channel. And as is always the case now, where Putin is extremely careful and ambiguous in his use of language, Medvedev is completely clear. And he said that he said in his telegram channel in his on his telegram channel he said that there are signs that the west is running out of steam they are visible this also applies to financing because it is impossible to spend on a foreign country the same thing outrages a significant part of the population in europe and even in the united states but even here they are trying to make various tricks to bring us to a certain line so that our enemy gets a break. The task is to push through a negotiation process that will help to weaken Russia and on the other hand to build up the forces of our enemy. That's the kind of negotiation we don't need. They are simply harmful despite the fact that Russia has never given up on negotiations as a tool. Our president has repeatedly spoken about this. The question is, what are we negotiating about? What point do we start from? And that point is very simple. We need to recognise the realities. So, in conclusion, <laughs> what the Russians are saying, what Putin is in effect saying, what Medvedev is also saying is, look, look, people want to come to us with some kind of proposal, even a proposal that leaves Odessa under the control of some sort of Ukraine. Well, we will consider it. But it has to be a proposal that satisfies our concerns, not just about the security of our state, which is to say Russia, but about the security of our people as well, which is to say Russians, and that includes the Russians in Odessa. That is one of the realities that must be addressed. And we're not going to agree to anything less than that and talk about freezes and ceasefires and that kind of thing that's not on the agenda for us at all and at the same time we are not going to solicit negotiations we are not going to go out there and ask the ukrainians or the europeans or the americans for any sort of proposals. It's not for us to do that. We have our plan, we have our mission, which we set ourselves in the special military operation. We've outlined it right at the outset. It's all set out there in black and white. We will pursue that until all of those objectives are achieved. If those objectives can be achieved as a result of some sort of proposal that the Ukrainians or the West come up with, well and good. But until that happens, we will continue with this war. And in the meantime, all talk of freezes and ceasefires and anything like that, we're not interested in at all. So... There's a lot more in Putin's speech. He essentially hinted, or in fact he did more than hint, he to all intents and purposes said that in terms of the economic logic, there had to be a um, integration of the Black Sea area into Russia as well. That was how I construed some of his words. Of course, the other point about his speech, where he spent most of his time, especially in the speech, but also to a great extent 
in his question and answer session was in his overall conception of how humanity will be shaped from this point onwards, what the next stage of history is. And he confirmed a point which I've made many times, that the Russians no longer see their future as part of Europe. This is now something that they come to understand. He made a point which I myself made before, most recently, in a programme um, that Alex Christoforo and I made, a, a live stream with Brian Boletic on Danny Haifong's channel. I said that as far as the Russians are concerned, they didn't turn their back on Europe. They didn't turn their back on the West. It was the Europeans and the West which repeatedly slammed the door in their faces. Putin actually said as much in those same sort of words. So he said they no longer see their future in Europe. They've come to recognize that they are a civilizational state, a huge landmass built around, of course, the ethnic Russians, but incorporating, also including fully and in a fully equal way, people of other ethnicities and cultures who are nonetheless a part of this Russian world. And he said that it's a civilizational state like India is and China is. And as he implied, Africa will one day become and other places around the world will also. And he went out of his way to say that all of these civilization states and cultures, they are on equal standing with the West. He spoke about the West having achieved a position of historically temporary advantage as a result of its brutal aggression towards other civilizations and cultures over the preceding centuries, which to a great extent still continues to this day. He says that under this, as a result of this um, aggressiveness implemented through first colonial and then neo-colonial policies, the West accumulated enormous wealth. That is now, however, being contested. The new system that is going to emerge is not going to be one where the West continues to have any kind of dominance. The West will become just one civilization amongst several, and each of these civilizations has equal weight and equal value, and that the way forward is for them to work together and to cooperate with each other whilst accepting and respecting the differences. So, as he also said in response to a question, it is an anti-imperialist message, but with a twist. He says, he said, it's different from the kind of anti-imperialist imperialist policies once pursued by the Soviet Union, which were class-based and ideology-based, it is one instead that is based upon a recognition that Western imperialism is driven by acquisitiveness and geopolitics, and it's led to an unfair and unstable world. Russia is opposed to it because it is itself a victim not because it sees Western imperialism as a manifestation of the international class struggle, as the Soviet Union once did. It's quite a sophisticated point, actually, suggests, again, that Putin is 
rather more of an intellectual than I think some people acknowledge, and perhaps one who is better informed about um, certainly Soviet politics and policies and ideologies than is always understood. But anyway, this is obviously an attractive message for people outside the West. It must be, as I've, we pointed out in our programme, Alex Christoforo and I, um, quite um, an astonishing thing for people in Latin America or Africa or perhaps to a lesser extent in, the, in Asia and the Middle East, but it must nonetheless be an exciting thing to hear a leader of such a powerful country as Russia saying that their cultures, their civilizations, carry equal weight and value as, those the, as that of the West. It's not something one has heard before. It's certainly not something that the Soviet leaders used to say. But anyway, that is what he said. And again, I've discussed this before. He made it clear that he sees the world functioning stably through a concert of great powers based on these civilizational states, each respecting the other, each no longer interfering or meddling in the affairs of the other, but each one trading stably and equally and fairly with the other in order to create a harmonious and peaceful balance in which no one is threatened and no one is threatening. And again, as is now very often the case, the Russians, like the Chinese, and of course Putin in this particular speech, said that the framework, that this concert of powers must work under, should be the United Nations, based on its charter and on international law. There's nothing to put in its place. And the rules-based order that the West harps on about is arbitrary and self-serving and ultimately and profoundly unjust, and it will not do. Now, all again, all of this is very interesting, and um, it shows the extraordinary intellectual ambition, both of Putin and of the Russian leadership at this time. But of course, it also um, actually leaves open another possibility about Ukraine itself, because with Putin talking about Russia as a civilizational state formed over a millennium, one could argue, if one accepts Putin's historical perspective, which is a historical perspective accepted by many, perhaps even most Russians. Anyway, one could argue that Ukraine actually belongs, or at least would fit in very comfortably, within this civilizational state, this Russian civilizational state. After all, it did before, and why shouldn't it again? The cultures are similar, the languages are similar, the religion is basically the same. So isn't it more logical for Ukraine eventually to become part of that greater civilization, which is Russia, the Russian world, brought back into the motherland, the Russian state. Now, he didn't say that in this speech, but it seemed to me that the question was there, hovering, 
And given that we've had statements like those from Vyacheslav Volodin talking about Ukraine either capitulating on Russian terms, and I've basically set out what those are, or in the alternative, ceasing to exist as a state, one can see in this speech, or one way of looking at this speech, would be to say that Putin is in some ways preparing the conceptual framework in case the second of those possibilities, Ukraine ceasing to exist as a state, does actually come about. Anyway, there was an awful lot more in the speech than these things. He talked a lot about economics. He gave a positive view of the overall state of the Russian economy. He spoke at length about Europe's economic problems, about America's economic problems. He spoke very favorably, as I've said, about China and India. He said that Russia was not going to lower the nuclear threshold. He confirmed um, the successful test of the Russian nuclear-powered cruise missile, the Budavesnik, about which very little is known, even its appearance is somewhat shadowy, but it is, from what one can understand, a ground-launched cruise missile operated with an engine that is fueled by a nuclear reactor, giving it, in effect, an unlimited range. Apparently, it's a ground-launched missile, so it can be launched from Russian territory, and it's apparently stealthy and subsonic, and since it's nuclear-powered, it can, in theory, hit any target anywhere in the world. So that's quite a potent new weapon. Anyway, he discussed things like that. And he also spoke at very great length about the conflict in Armenia. He severely criticised the diplomacy, both of Pres Prime Minister Pashinyan and his existing government, and incidentally of, of the preceding Armenian government. Also, he said that their refusal to acknowledge the military realities, the rise in the power of Azerbaijan, the growing power and wealth of Azerbaijan, that it was this which has brought Armenia to this disaster, that they rejected the various proposals that Putin made for a compromise on the Nagorno-Karabakh issue, proposals which Putin said he was confident he could get not just Azerbaijan to accept, but also the Security Council of the United Nations to ratify, which would have confirmed Nagorno-Karabakh status as an Armenian area, perhaps even joined to Armenia. He said that he anticipated that he could have managed that and that would have confirmed it in international law. He said that this was all disastrously undermined by the catastrophic negotiations that Pashinyan had with the European Union in Prague and Brussels, where um, Pashinyan, without consulting the, Rus the Russians, simply recognized without conditions Nagorno-Karabakh as part of the territory of Azerbaijan. So he had an awful lot to say. But in this program, as I've said, I am focusing on what he had to say about the Ukrainian conflict. And, as I said, in some respects, he left things open. But in the context of those other statements by the those other Russian officials. It's very clear now 
what the direction of travel is. The Russians will not accept a ceasefire. They will not accept a freeze. They will certainly not negotiate on the basis of President Zelensky's formula, which effectively demands their complete capitulation. They will not agree to anything less than for Ukraine to remain fully outside NATO for cast-iron security guarantees to be provided for all Russians, note, no longer Russian speakers, just Russians, right across the territory of Ukraine, places like Odessa, Nikolaev, whatever. And it is very difficult for me to see, and I don't believe that Putin himself actually believes that this can happen without all of these territories being drawn into Russia itself. So, most interesting speech from Putin, as all of his speeches are. As I said, I think the reason he preserves a measure of ambiguity is because he doesn't want to shut the door completely on negotiations, on negotiations that might be suggested to him, not by the Western powers. He's not interested in those. But if he gets proposals from the Chinese or the African states or conceivably even India, he doesn't want to say in advance that he's not interested in talking about those. He wants to leave that door ajar because he understands that that is how he wins the trust and friendship of those countries, those possible mediators. But ultimately, as I said, if you take a step back and look at the overall realities, it is clear to me where the Russians are going and I can't see this conflict stopping without Kharkiv, Odessa and all of these places once more becoming a part of Russia. After all, if Putin did not intend to bring Odessa under Russian control, for example, why would he have called it, identified it as a Russian city? And why would he have not said straightforwardly in response to the question from Margarita Simonian that the Russians have no interest in Odessa and they understand that it will remain a part of Ukraine? He didn't do that, and I think it's legitimate, therefore, for us to reach our own conclusions. Now, before I go on, and I will be relatively brief in the other topics I will discuss, because to my mind, these words of Putin's and Medvedev's, the most interesting ones, Medvedev, again, as I said, making it very clear that the Russians are not interested in a freeze or a ceasefire, and that the Russians will not solicit negotiations with Ukraine or with the West it's for them to come up with proposals. Anyway, before I leave Putin's speech, I'm going to just turn quickly to what he had to say about Prigozhin. And I am inclined to think that despite Putin's protestations, um, a question that he got towards the end of the discussion was most probably planted. It was a question about Prigozhin, about what had happened with respect to Prigozhin, Prigozhin's death and about the mutiny that had taken place. And Putin said that he hadn't really wanted to discuss it. This wasn't his intention or wish to talk about those things, but nonetheless, he said that he did, in fact, discuss it. And he said, interestingly, that he's just had a discussion with Strichin, who is the head 
of Russia's investigative committee, the body in Russia most closely analogous to the FBI, at least in its uh, crime investigation and enforcement capacity. It's the organization that investigates serious crimes. Anyway, um, Bestrichin apparently reported to Putin that um, gr grenade fragments had been found on the bodies of Prigozhin and of the other people on the plane that crashed with Prigozhin on board and which um, had that disastrous accident which we all remember. And Putin said that he did wonder whether possibly um, what happened was that these people with their well-known past and record might have been playing with grenades whilst being high. I mean, that was what he said. Um, he then went on to admit that there, he has no evidence at all for that claim, that guess. It's just a speculation on his part based upon the fact that a quantity of a certain drug was found in one of the buildings um, that had previously belonged to the Wagner organization. Now, what to make of this, these rather bizarre comments. Now, I'm going to say straight away that I think this looks to me very, very much like a steer. And as I said, I think it was a planted question. I don't believe that uh, it's just chance, or at least it might have been, but I think it's most unlikely that it's just chance that Putin was asked this question just shortly after he's supposed to have had this meeting with Bastrichin where they discussed the Prigozhin affair, a meeting, by the way, which has not been, uh, we've not had any um, account of on the Kremlin's website. I have noticed, by the way, that over the last few days, the Kremlin's website has been rather thin in terms of providing us with details of Putin's activities. And it's likely that he has had a meeting with, Prigo uh, with uh, Bastrichin during this time. But anyway, what are we to make of all of this? As I said, to me, it looks like a steer. A steer made following this meeting. And I'm going to now express my own guess as to what happened. And it is, let me stress a guess, it's not based on any information at all, but it's not, shall we say, a guess plucked out of the air. It's an informed guess based on historical knowledge of this kind of thing. I think Putin knows exactly who was behind Prigozhin's murder. That's the first thing to say. I think he's figured it out. Probably he's had other information independently from Bestrichin, from his intelligence um, services. And I think he knows exactly how Prigozhin's death came about, and I think he knows who was responsible, and I don't believe it was an accident of the kind that was that he is, that Putin is describing. He admits there's no evidence, no forensic evidence that these people who died, Prigozhin and the others, were under the influence of any drugs. It's just his guess that they might have been. So why bring that up at all? So the fact that he did is a steer, to my mind, telling Bastrichin and the investigative committee, look, this is probably what happened. Why don't you wrap up your investigations now? There's no need to inquire much further because clearly this was an accident 
clearly these people were high and were playing around with grenades and that was the cause of this event. And that brings me back to something that took place in June, a meeting that took place in June, which is also not reported on Putin's website, which is a meeting that Putin held in the Kremlin with Prigozhin and with the Council of Commanders of Wagner. And over the course of that meeting, Putin made a proposal. He offered that Wagner could remain intact as a single unit. It could continue to participate in the special military operation, but that this unit, this military unit, organized in the same way as before, with the same people in charge as before, this unit would sign a contract with the Russian Defense Ministry. Instead of the soldiers, the fighters, signing individual contracts, Wagner as a unit would do so. And Putin says, and we've only got his account of the meeting, but there's no reason to doubt this, he says that Prigozhin, rejected this proposal, even as all of the others present at that meeting appeared inclined to agree. And I think that this was the moment when Prigozhin's fate was sealed. I think that from that moment, Putin let events take their course, there's probably a lot of unhappiness within Wagner that um, the fact that this, for them, attractive proposal had been rejected by Prigozhin. I've long, for some time now, come increasingly round to the view that the assassination bears the hallmark of an inside job somebody from Wagner, in other words, arranging for whatever Blom was placed on the plane to have done so. And the people from Wagner went away. They came to realize that whilst Prigozhin was around, a resolution of the conflict with the Russian government, with the defense ministry, and with Putin himself was impossible and they went ahead, and in their own way, they made sure that Prigozhin was taken out of the way. And I think Putin, who wants this, these tough and trained fighters back on the battlefields, as I said, he probably knows this or has figured this out. He's basically would have sat back let events take their course, which they did. And now with Prigozhin out of the way, he's appointed the new man, Troshev, to take charge of what's left. Um, Prigozhin's son has now been put in charge of the um, financial side of the organisation, the company and all that. But ultimately, the major part of... Wagner is once more fighting or going to be fighting in the conflict area but under the aegis either of the Ministry of Defence or in the case of some other parts of Wagner perhaps under a contract with the Roskvadia organisation the other agency of the Russian government which is in charge of internal security. So that is what I think happened. Anyway, I'm not going to waste more time on this. And I think, for me, this is the final end of the Prigozhin affair. I think that now we can confidently draw a line underneath it. I don't think we'll be hearing much more about this affair from this point onwards. Well... That now brings me to what has been happening on the front lines. And the answer is very little. Oh, I should take that back. I should say an awful lot, but nothing that has changed the situation in any fundamental way. 
there was lots of Ukrainian attacks yesterday. Again, in the Robotino area, um, it seems that the Russians have been attacking around Verbovoye and have been pushing the Ukrainians steadily back. That the Ukrainians launched more attacks southwest of Rabotino but were repelled, and that there are various attempts to break through to this other village of Kopani have also been uh, um, repelled. So, significant defeats for the Ukrainians there, no sign of any breakthrough there. And we've also had. Um, reports that the Russians now are continuing to push the Ukrainians back in the Vremevka salient. They seem to be definitely have gained the initiative there. The one place where the Ukrainians continue to remain active is in and around Bakhmut. There was an, reports that a Battalion strength attack was made by the Ukrainian army um, in the Klesheyevka area. There's still uncertainty as to exactly what happened. I'm going to anticipate by saying that I think it is most unlikely that there was any significant Ukrainian breakthrough and that the Russian forces overall have the situation in Bakhmut, in and around Bakhmut, under control. And, of course, further north, around Orekhovo, Vasilyevka, they appear to be advancing. There were, again, major Russian drone strikes right across Ukraine yesterday. This has now become a routine thing. And there were also major Russian missile and drone strikes on Ukrainian positions on the west bank of the Dnieper. We continue to have all of this uncertainty, all these discussions about a possible Ukrainian amphibious assault across the Dnieper. I'm seeing more and more reports that the weather now has turned conclusively autumnal, that there's rain and wind and that the temperatures are falling. I am going to guess that the prospects of a successful river crossing, contested river crossing, of the Dnieper are dimming by the day. I don't know whether such a plan actually even exists. Given that we're dealing with Ukraine, the possibility that it might do is always there. But I have to say that this doesn't look to me a likely successful prospect if it's ever done and we're getting more reports of an accelerated Russian build-up in the north it does seem as if this 25th combined arms army has been substantially reinforced and might indeed be preparing some kind of move in the Kupiansk area before long. As I discussed yesterday in my program, the Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu has had a high-level meeting at the headquarters of the Russian forces that are participating in this conflict in Rostov. And it does seem to me that something is being prepared, and probably on a very big scale, that what it is, it's for the moment impossible for me at least to say. I noticed, by the way, that even people like David Axe are now starting to um, become increasingly concerned about the direction of the war. He said that Russia, he's written a piece in the Daily Telegraph, its title is Russia is preparing for forever war, which emphatically is not true. He admits that, well, at least he says that he's one of those other people who has accepted the view that Shoigu, at that recent meeting with the 
Ministry of Defence Board um, anticipated that um, the war would end sometime in 2025, which is more than a year away, but it is not a forever war. But anyway, um, David Axe acknowledged that um, the Russians are mobilising. He says that they're building up their forces, that um, 300,000 men were called up, reservists were called up last year, that another 400,000 have been recruited into the, are being recruited into the military this year. He sort of gives the implication that these are conscripts, but of course, in reality, as discussed, they are actually um, volunteers. They're people who've signed volunteers tier contracts. He notes the resumption in Omsk of production of a modernized version of the T-80 tank. T-80 tank, Soviet Union's most advanced tank at the time when the Soviet Union broke up. Like the Abrams tank, it uses a gas turbine engine derived, by the way, from a helicopter engine, apparently a much more uh, reliable engine than the one, or at least a more cost-effective engine than the one the Abrams uses. And he admits, David Axe admits, that the Russians have the men and weapons for a long war in Ukraine, and these, there is no evidence they lack the political will to keep fighting. And he admits that even though Ukraine has the will, it's running out of resources. He says that they still have enough fresh troops. Well, that's questionable. I've been reading more and more reports to say that, in practice, um, there's been uh, problems meeting the conscription targets in Ukraine. Apparently, Ukraine's conscription target for September again fell catastrophically short, and regardless of that, David Axe admits that there's little sign so far that um, there's much sign that the West is able to provide Ukraine to meet Ukraine's weapons needs, which are, of course, the key for success in this war. So... Even someone like David Axe is now acknowledging the reality of the Russian build-up. And, of course, that continues. Now, we're having a meeting in Spain. It's a meeting that the EU is convening to try to find some sort of... to continue support for Ukraine. There's reports in Politico that Ukraine is freaking out after the um, decision by the US Congress to park the issue of Ukrainian aid, at least for the moment, until the House has elected a new speaker. There's um, also growing worry within some parts of the European Union that the United States might be preparing to walk away from this problem. Josep Borrell has acknowledged that if the United States stops providing Ukraine with financial support, the European Union is in no position to make up the difference. And, of course, if it comes to weapons supply, well, I went through all those articles yesterday, which admitted that Britain is out of weapons. Germany, I would add, is also largely out of weapons. Ammunition production is failing to keep up. Putin, by the way, was talking about that at his Valdai speech and during the Q&A. So all of these problems increasingly intractable. There is no agreement within the EU to authorise extra spending. There's also reports of increasing acrimony between 
European leaders. There's been a long piece in the Financial Times which tells us that Olaf Scholz, the Chancellor, German Chancellor, and Emmanuel Macron, the French President, don't get on. And there are more reports today in Der Spiegel, of all places, and elsewhere in the German media, that there has been a major falling out over Ukraine between Charles Michel, the European Council President, and Ursula von der Leyen, the EU, uh, the, uh, the President of the European Commission. Apparently, Ursula von der Leyen was not happy with Michel saying that Ukraine would become a member of the European Union by 2030. Even Ursula von der Leyen realises that that is far too over-optimistic and it seems that there are other issues between them. There's other points of argument as well. And all of this, as you might expect, as a project starts to fail, those who were its authors start engaging in recriminations and quarrelling with each other. And that is precisely what we see. In the meantime, the Russians, as I said, continue to prepare. Ukraine continues to remain stuck. We will see what is coming over the next few months. Now, inevitably, there is also a certain amount of straw clutching going on um, in Britain. They've been talking about this great naval victory that Ukraine is supposed to have won in the Black Sea, by which they mean the fact that certain ships of the Russian Black Sea have been redeployed from Sevastopol to Novorossiysk. Um, I don't really see what difference that makes. <laughs> um, Novorossiysk is also a port on the Black Sea. Russian ships can still operate in the Black Sea, despite um, being in Novorossiysk, except Sevastopol. Sevastopol has been targeted by Storm Shadow and potentially before long Taurus and Attackham's missiles. The Western powers have said that they will not allow Ukraine to launch missile strikes on ports that um, remained part of Russia following the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. So parking the fleet or parts of it in Novorossiysk seems to me simply ensures that the fleet is out of harm's way and continue, can continue to do its job. Russian fleet has, I believe, six submarines operating, its uh, frigates, its um, uh, missile boats still able to function and launch missiles. The Russians are able to dominate the skies over the Black Sea with their air force. They're able to destroy Ukrainian boats and ships, and they do so on a regular basis. Again, it seems to me that this is an imaginary victory, which the British in particular are talking up, because they have no real victories, no real actual victories to talk about instead. And again, that old hoary subject about the ruble has resumed. The announcement by the Fed, the guidance from the Fed, that um, um, that um, interest rates are going to remain um, high for much longer than had previously been supposed because inflation problems um, are going to persist has inevitably led to a strengthening of the dollar that has had an effect of reducing the price of oil. I once wrote a piece some years ago explaining how a strong dollar tended to result in a lower oil price. It's quite likely, I suspect, before long, by the way, that the Saudis and the Russians will get together and might even cut oil production again. But anyway, we will see. But anyway, along with massive problems in the bond markets, which I'm not going to waste time talking about, um, all of this has put further pressure on the ruble 
and it's trading at the moment at just over 100 rubles to the dollar, a fact which, as I said, the Russians will be sh shrugging over. They don't owe debts in dollars or euros anymore. The sanctions have basically ended all of that. So it might feed in to some extent with domestic inflation. But in all other respects, this isn't going to make any significant difference to the economic realities. I'm going to add, by the way, that on the topic of the ruble, there's been considerable discussion in Russia over the last few months, discussions that apparently were launched all the way back in the spring of last year, whereby it seems that the experiment that the Russians launched in the early 2000s, um, at the time when Alexei Kudrin um, was the finance minister and German Greff was the economics minister. The experiment that the Russians have followed ever since of having an essentially convertible ruble. That might be coming to an end. The Russians are apparently now increasingly looking at the possibility of making the ruble a non-convertible currency in the way that the Chinese RMB and the Indian rupee is, and that this would be a more logical fit within the global system, the global grips, uh, BRICS payment system that is emerging. In which case, this issue of the ruble will presumably end. Anyway, that is a very big topic, one which I will discuss another day. But anyway, suffice to say, um, movements in the ruble, which will probably still strengthen anyway by the end of this month, and a redeployment of some ships from one port to another are not going to change the trajectory of the war which is now set, events in the United States, the possible election of Jim Jordan as Speaker, might do. But if so, they will only do so by accelerating an outcome, a Ukrainian defeat, which, to me, is looking now all but inevitable. Well, that's me for today. Um, no doubt I will be discussing the events in Congress um, rather more closely in my next programme. Though I would say again, despite a very, very kind comment from someone who worked in Congress and who commended my analysis, this is something that I find difficult to uh, discuss because it is outside, very much outside, what goes on in Congress, the US Congress, uh, goes very far outside my um, own, well, shall we say, the, the, the sort of topics that I'm experienced in discussing and I'm generally informed about. But I do acknowledge the importance of this issue and as such, I will return to it and having returned to it with the caveat I've just given, I think it's only proper if I nonetheless express my views as the developments unfold. Anyway, in the meantime, this is where I end this programme. Thank you for joining me once more. Just to repeat once again, you can find all our programmes on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble and X, the former Twitter. You can also um, support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar. Don't forget also to check out our shop. We're having a, a, a sale, so you can buy things now at a 20% discount. Um, if you go to the website, that will show you how it's done. And last but not least, if you've liked this video, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. That's me for today. More from me soon. Have a very good day.